Good morning. Here we go. We're in the middle of a series where we're talking about a faith that waits. And what we've described so far, a faith that waits holds on to both pain and promises. A faith that waits has to hold on to the reality of both hurt and hope. And in Romans chapter 8, that's what we're working our way through. It describes a faith that waits. Paul turns to a subject that is of great interest to us. If we're in the middle of circumstances that would rather not wade through, what's the role of prayer? Where does prayer come in? And it's that if you take out your worship folder, uh, let's read the text and then we'll apply it. The role of prayer in cultivating a faith that waits. Paul writes in, in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 27, but he says in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And what we found in this text, the last time we looked at it, we found unspoken requests and uncomfortable answers. We found unspoken requests really from two different sources, from Christians and from the Holy Spirit. It says we do not know what we ought to pray for. So the first unspoken request is from Christians. We don't know what we ought to pray for. We have different kinds of needs. We have spirit needs and body needs. Those come into conflict with one another, and it makes it confusing for us to determine what the will of God is. And then, so we can't utter with confidence what we ought to pray for. And the other unspoken requests are of the spirit. It says the spirit intercedes for us with groanings, with groans that words cannot express. And the, the intercession of the Spirit then is inaudible. It can't be spoken because it doesn't need to be spoken. The Spirit prays from within our hearts inaudible requests that rise to the ears of God the Father. So we have unspoken requests and then we have uncomfortable answers. The Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And what we determined, if the Spirit prays for us, right? The Spirit prays for us. And if the Spirit's requests are in accordance with God's will, will we receive what the Spirit prays for us? I'm going to say that again. If the Spirit prays for us and his prayers are in accordance with God's will, Will God grant the requests that the Spirit is asking for us? The answer is, absolutely, he will. So the issue then is that, well, here's a question. What is the Spirit praying for? That's a good question, right? What does the Spirit pray for? We know it's the will of God, but what does the will of God Involved. And what we looked in the context of Romans chapter 8, it talks about the fact that the Spirit cries out within us that we are children of God, but it also says we have and we hold that sense in the midst of groanings and sufferings. The will of God involves suffering, which last time we, we kind of landed on this. It's really not that we don't know the will of God. It's that we do know it and don't like it, to be pretty direct. The will of God involves things that are uncomfortable. It's not that we don't know the will of God. We do know it and don't like it. Well, I guess what it says, we are experiencing God's will in both the joyful things and the not-so-joyful things, in the sense of things that we want to have and in the sense of the things that we'd like to have but don't. Uh, the will of God involves suffering, and what we looked at as well is that it's important to clarify why he says this. See, Paul's letters are one side of a phone conversation, and if he's saying, the Spirit prays for you in accordance with God's will, and, and the Spirit then will ask for things that God would 
will, yes, so what's happening on the other side of the phone? And the sense here in this passage is the phone, this request, the problem Paul's addressing is not some poor child who is suffering maybe sexual or physical abuse. And, and Paul is saying, well, you've just got to understand that that's the will of God. And the will of God involves suffering, so I'm sorry. That is not what's happening in this text. It's not what's happening in this text. So if some of you are exposed to terrible, awful things, it's not that God is saying to you and what Paul is saying, oh, I'm sorry, it's the will of God. Now, it does involve suffering, but that's not why Paul's writing this. Why Paul's writing this is there are individuals that are experiencing difficult things, and this is what they're being told. Well, I'm sorry. The reason why you're experiencing what you're experiencing is you're not praying the right way. If you prayed this way, then you'd be in a whole different place. And that's what Paul's addressing. No, no. You can't pray your way out of difficulties. Not going to happen. Because the will of God involves suffering. Um, look what it's, talk about God's will. Matthew 3, 16 through 4, 1, it says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And then it says, Then the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness, The Spirit drove Jesus in the wilderness right after his baptism. And why is that? This is what the Spirit desired. This is was God's will. God's will regularly involves water experiences followed immediately by wilderness experiences. One minute, Jesus is rising up out of the water, hearing the Father say, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Immediately following that, he's led into the wilderness and the next thing he listens to then is his stomach growling and the tempter urging him to say to God, prove it. Prove that he loves you. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert. And it's not that this just happens to Jesus. The children of Israel experienced the exact same thing. On the far side of the Red Sea, they were led immediately into the wilderness. They stepped out of the Red Sea and within two to three days, they stepped into the wilderness, and this is what we find in the text. Moses writes, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, as a man disciplines his son. So the Lord, your God, disciplines you. As a man disciplines his son or daughter, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Being led by the Spirit from the water to the wilderness is related to discipline. Let's talk about discipline for a moment. We're going to talk about four things very briefly. We're going to talk about the process of discipline, the motive, the focus, and the goal. Let's talk about the process of discipline. It says, He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known. That's what the process of discipline looks like, being caused to hunger. Hunger, some of you might be hungry. Hunger is a need that is impossible to sweep aside. Now, if you ate last night, you're not that hungry. But if it was weeks, you could not ignore hunger. It's, it's an uncomfortable need that is impossible to ignore. And what it seems that God triggers uncomfortable, uncontrollable reactions. And that's the process of discipline. God triggers uncomfortable, uncontrollable reactions. Things that you're not going to want to feel, but you're going to feel them. Things that you'd like to be able to press down, you're not going to be able to press them down. You can't pray them away, wish them away, give them away, avoid them. They are going to be felt and it's not going to feel good. It's a process of discipline. God will move us into situations that will surface uncomfortable feelings and unfulfilled desires. And in the wilderness, we will ask this question. Why aren't you answering my prayers? 
We'll ask that question. And oftentimes, we will hear nothing. Just the wind blowing through the wilderness. We will not get the bread we want. We will not get the assurance we want. And you know what our natural assumption is? And again, I'm not pointing the finger at any of you and not pointing it at me. It's something we all deal with. Our natural reaction will be to assume that someone did something wrong. We'll blame ourselves. Or we'll blame somebody else. Our natural reaction will be to assume that we missed the will of God. God would never lead you into a wilderness, would he? Would he? He would never do that. It must be somebody else's fault. It must be your fault. That's what we'll assume. That's the process of discipline, the motive of discipline. The word discipline literally means child rearing. Child rearing. Discipline is driven by love, not anger. I want you to listen to this. God never leads a stranger into the wilderness. Biblically, the only people God leads into the wilderness, into the wilderness of wanting, are children of his, those whom he owns, those whom he's developing. Um, it says, know that in your heart that a man disciplines his son. So the Lord your God disciplines you. This is only something God does for his kids. The, so the motive of discipline is child rearing. It's driven by love, not anger. The focus is on the future, not the past. Sometimes discipline is incorrectly administered. Sometimes discipline is more like punishment. We grew up in homes where if you did something wrong, then sometimes we have to be punished because we caused pain and we need to be given pain. Now, that's not really discipline. Discipline properly administered is not focused on what you did wrong. Discipline, when it's properly administered, is looking in which direction? Ahead to what you'll do right. That's the purpose of discipline. Or oh, it might be painful, but discipline properly administered is not, you did this, and I'll tell you, you're going to pay. That's punishment. Discipline is, you know what, you're going to have to experience some consequences, but the reason for the consequences is not payback. It's that you've got to learn, at some point, you've got to learn how to master, how to do this. So discipline is, I want you to be in a place where you can do the right thing. That's the focus of discipline. When God leads us into the wilderness, it's not because you got angry and God's going to send the goons out after you. You know, you blew it. You know, you did this and you know he should have done that. And so God's going to get after you now because you did that bad thing. Again, discipline involves the removal of things that need to go, but the addition of things that need to be developed. It's both. How about the goal of discipline? The goal to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. There is something in the translation there that is not supposed to be there. It says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the... In, in the original text, word is not there. Here's what it says. Man does not live on bread alone, but on everything that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Do you know what I think it's suggesting? Bread comes from God's mouth. God doesn't want us to live by bread alone because bread comes from God's mouth, but bread isn't the only thing that comes from God's mouth. What else comes from God's mouth? Words and promises. What God teaches us in the wilderness is we don't live by bread alone, which we can see, but on everything that comes from the mouth of the Lord, his promises. You know what happens in the wilderness? We transfer our trust from what we see to what he says. That's in the Bible somewhere, isn't it? We live by faith, not by sight. Easy to trust God when it's right there. I can touch it. What's tougher if I'm in a place that I can't touch it? It's not in the checkbook. It's not sitting across the table. It's not at my workplace. It's not in my family. I ask God to do this. I ask God to do this, and it's not there. But what is there are 
promises. And in the wilderness, we transfer our trust from what we see to what he says. And that's the goal of discipline, to teach us to live by faith and not by sight. And we saw that that's something he leads his children into the wilderness to experience. But that was the Israelites. How about us? Let's see what it says in Peter. 1 Peter 1, I'll read. It says, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. It says a couple things about faith. It suggests that faith is protective. What it says, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope, talks about and into an inheritance that will not spoil or fade, kept in heaven. And then look, verse 5, who through faith are shielded by God's power. I want to tell you what shielded by God's power means. Shielded is guarded. I want you to imagine that this is a compound and that we are under attack. And the National Guard deploys a force to act as a a protective perimeter. And they are stationed around this compound erecting a protective perimeter. There are individuals that would like to get in here to do us harm. They are guarding us. That's the picture. Who through faith are guarded by God's power. God's power erects a protective perimeter and protects us from some things. And we're going to learn what those things are. But that's the image. Faith is protected. It's the image of a military presence protecting us from influences that would threaten us from experiencing our eternal inheritance. Faith is protective. Protective. Faith is also purified. What it says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Faith is not an all or nothing. It's not a black or white, up or down, plus or minus. Faith is is evident in degrees. It is like gold. Gold doesn't exist just in one form. There are different purities to gold, correct? And the refining is how the quality and the purity of the gold becomes more valuable and more pure. As with gold, the purity and quality of faith are increased by exposure to fire. But in the case of faith, it's not physical flame that purifies faith. It is suffering. It says, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief, in all kinds of trials. Faith is purified in the wilderness. That's where what we see and what God says comes into conflict. We don't see the bread. We don't see the provision. We have the promises and we hear God telling us promises, but we hear our stomach growl and there's tension involved there, isn't it? And sometimes what we do is we let go of the reality of our pain, and we try to just hold on to God, and this is called hypocrisy. How are you doing? I'm fine. Any problems? No, not at all. Letting go of the hurt will not allow us to wait, because God knows that we feel it. We've got to hold on to the hurt, but hold on to the promise. And some people let go of the promises. How are you doing? I guess, okay, under the circumstances. (laughs) Doing fine. But that lets go of hope. 
We've got to hold on to the hurt and hold on to the hope. Hold on to the reality of both things in order to cultivate a faith that waits. A faith that waits is not hanging on for heaven. That's not a faith that waits. Faith is purified in the wilderness. God's will, two words. Two words. I'm going to give you five words, all of which begin with S. You know, I love that kind of thing. Five S's, that's great. God's will is to surface hunger and to teach you to soothe it. To surface hunger and to teach you to soothe hunger by holding on to promises. The words that come out of his mouth. Okay, what about our prayers? Faith prays. What about our prayers? Um, let's think about this for a little bit. What it says in Luke 8, the seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Another way that we can get our hands around God's will, here it is. Hear, retain, persevere, produce. Hear the word, retain it. You hold on to it. You persevere in holding on to it, and you produce a crop. You remember those words? Hear, retain, persevere, produce. What's the hardest one of those four for you? Hear? Not difficult for us to hear things in America. You could hear stuff from God all over the place. Hearing? Retaining? Eww, that's a little more challenging. <laughs> Holding on to his word when I have to hold on to pain? Where are you? Why aren't you doing it? Well, some of us, we don't really talk to him at all. We complain to those around us. We say it must be their fault because God would never lead me into a place where I would be suffering. Can't be God. Hear, retain, persevere. That's it. See? You know what makes persevering hard? Pretending. It's one thing to persevere when you can be honest. It's enough thing to try to persevere when you're pretending. You can only hold a smile so long. You know, it's, it's hard to hold a smile for a long time when you really don't feel like smiling. It's hard to persevere, but if you, then you can hear, retain, persevere, produce. Um, the thing that causes that to be challenged, the reason that it's hard for us to hear, retain, persevere, and produce is because God's word is choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. The reason why it's hard to hear, retain, persevere, and produce is because God's word is choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. Let me tell you what the word choked is. It really means to be crowded or thronged. That's what it means. Choked is not strangled. It means to be crowded or thronged. And here's where it shows up later. As Jesus was on his way in Luke 8, 42, the crowds almost, and it's translated, crushed him. But it's the same word. It's the same word. So in the parlance of the seeds, it's the crowds almost choked him. But the crowds didn't do this. They thronged him, crowded him. That's what worries, riches, and pleasures do. It's not that they're anti-God. It's that they crowd and throng us so there's 
no room for God's word. It crushes it and it moves it out. That's the, that's the image here. The picture is trying to talk to someone on the phone. Does that, does that drive you crazy? That drive you crazy? You're on the phone trying to talk to somebody and then you say something you shouldn't. And, so, and then if there's somebody around and they're, you say, wait a minute. And you know, it's, 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 you're trying to have a phone conversation and, and it's hard to do both of those things at the same time, isn't it? Well, it's difficult for some of us, maybe. Okay. <laughs> maybe I... Uh, like that. I'm trying to talk to you and there's individuals talking to me down here. You know, what it's, you know what it's like? The picture is trying to listen to God in a crowd. It's God's promises being choked out by the appeals of worries, riches, and pleasures. The influence of worries, riches, and pleasures, why they're problematic, is because they make it so that we're trying to listen to God in a crowd. Anybody understand what it means when it talks about somebody's head being loud? Your head is loud. Any of you understand that, having a loud head because of the voices? Now, I'm not talking about hearing voices, but I'm talking about the thoughts that just cascade into your mind. You wake up in the morning, and whoosh, there they are. You didn't summon them. It's like that they were waiting by the bedside. <laughs> just look and see, oh, she's still asleep. Okay, da 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 And then you wake up, bing, that whoop. And then they're, whoop. What are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about that? What if she does this? What if she does that? And you, you didn't ask to worry about those things. You didn't ask about having your mind being inundated. That's what it is with worries and riches and pleasures. Um, and you know what they all do? Worries, riches, and pleasures, they're, they're basic. All of them say the same thing, which is, don't just sit there, do something. That's what they do. Worries, don't just sit there, do something. Riches, don't just sit there, do something. Pleasure, don't just sit there, do something. They, they move us to action. And the problem in the wilderness is you can't get away from it. We try to silence our hunger via worries. We try to figure out everything that could go wrong. Everything that could go wrong. And we try to put a plug in each and every hole that could spring a leak. None of us know exactly what that's like. We try to silence things with worries. We try to silence hunger. Or we try to satisfy hunger with riches. I'll tell you what, if you get enough money, hunger is not a problem if you get enough money. What are you hungry for? Power, if you have enough money, you could get that. Protection, you have enough money. So we try to satisfy our hunger with pleasure or we sub with riches or we try to submerge our hunger with pleasures. I'll tie one on. If I'm three sheets to the wind, I'm not thinking about emotional hunger, even physical hunger. We try to silence or I told you I'd have five S's, didn't I? We try to silence our hunger by worrying, satisfy it by getting enough money, submerge it by experiencing enough pleasure. And what does God want us to do? Do you remember the first two? God's will is to surface the hunger and to silence it, satisfy it, submerge it, soothe it, soothe it with promises. God's voice ends up getting drowned out. We have a tendency to use prayer to try to eliminate suffering. We use prayer to try to eliminate suffering. And God gives us prayer not to eliminate suffering, but to endure it. Um, how do we soothe hunger? How do we soothe hunger by promises? That's what it says in Philippians 4. Gives us some, I think, some practical advice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious. 
Do not worry about anything. Easier said than done. The only thing I like about the Bible, it doesn't just say don't worry about it. Doesn't that drive you crazy? Don't worry about it. It might not happen. But it might happen. Hello? It doesn't just say don't worry. It gives some positive things. What do I do? It says, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard. Do you remember the picture I painted about us being in here and people trying to attack us and the National Guard posting a perimeter and that it says through faith are shielded by God's power in First Peter? This is the same word. The same word. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will erect a military perimeter and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And guess over time, now, they, they, this guard gets better over time as you use prayer, but what do you imagine this perimeter keeps out? What's trying to assault our minds? Worries, riches, pleasures. What is it that keeps our minds from being overrun by worries, riches, and pleasures? The peace of God erecting a military perimeter. The peace of God which transcends all understanding guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Keeps the crowd out enough so that his voice doesn't get drowned out. Okay, here's the question. How do you get the peace of God to do that? You know what it says? Pray about it. Pray about it. What are you concerned about? Why do you need more money? I'm not saying you don't. But what is the concern? What are you worrying about? Yourself, someone you care about? Why do you run to addictive things? What concern are you running away from? You know why we have addicted to pleasure? Because we can't stand the incursion of worries that flood our heads. Do you know what it's telling us here? God will erect a perimeter. You know what it will take? You're going to have to be honest with Him. Don't just use pattern prayers. Now, some of us learn some good prayers when we grow up. But in the midst of the wilderness, they're not going to, there's some prayers that are really good, but you're going to have to learn to speak truthfully with him, to be real with him. Say, God, I'm scared stiff. I know you say you promise, but, and that's, we have to be real. We have to be real. Prayer and everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Now, you just can't complain out loud. You've got to really look at who you're talking to. Sometimes we pray, but prayer is just, I don't like this, don't like that, don't like this, don't like that. This, this really stinks. You know, wait, hold on, just a minute. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, this, 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 you know what we're not even doing? We're not even thinking of who we're talking to. You've got to be real, but you've got to be still. You've got to think about who you're addressing. Think about him. Think about God. You know what he tells? He goes, one of the things God says to you, cease striving. You know what that literally means? We've talked about it before. Drop your hands. That's right. Let go of your cell phone. Stop doing your checkbook balance just for a little bit. Get rid of the calendar just for a minute. And this is what God says to you, okay? You're looking at me. I am God. I will be exalted in the nations and on earth, and I will never leave you and never forsake you. And it's not that you use this to say, okay, I shouldn't worry. Because then, you know what you can do when you've, you're being real and, and you're figuring out who you can, you're talking to? You know what you can do at that point? You can be honest with them. Talk to them. Exhale your concerns and inhale his commitments. I think that's how it 
That's how it works. The peace of God acts as a military blockade. You know what it means when it says the peace of God that transcends all understanding? The picture is not that the peace of God is so wonderful. It is wonderful, but that's not the image. You know what the literal thing is? The peace of God outranks human understanding. It can commandeer it. It's, it's what a captain can do to a corporal. The peace of God is bigger, has more authority, and through prayer, again, this is not going to be automatic, but instead of worrying in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, we make our requests known to God, and the peace of God starts to erect a, a perimeter, and when the thoughts come in, they say, stand down. And those thoughts begin to stand down because the peace of God is powerful. See, the peace of God is not a nice feeling. The peace of God is powerful. It, it's military. It's protective. That's the image here. You might think of UN peacekeeping forces. They're not nice. They have a nice purpose. They have weapons. And that's what the peace of God is. Can you think of that? The peace of God is like the UN peacekeeping forces. They have a peacekeeping agenda, but they're ready to use whatever means necessary in order to provide the protection that's necessary. That's what God's peace is like. It tells us, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Don't just worry about it, pray about it, but be clear about what God promises. Otherwise, you'll be tempted to discard prayer when it doesn't work. This thing used to not work. Fortunately, I did not discard it. Let this be prayer. Isn't prayer something you can just click at something and change circumstances? Isn't that the way it works with prayer? You know, so there's something in your wallet. Your wallet doesn't have enough stuff in it. Just take prayer out, click, whoa, look at this. Well, there's still nothing. But... <laughs> Isn't that the way it works? Isn't that the way it works? You're concerned about somebody in your family? Take the prayer thing, click, different. Problem goes away. Something that you can't escape from, click, use prayer, changes it. See, you know what ends up happening if you think that's what prayer does? You end up doing this with it. You know, there's got to be something wrong with this. It, it's not working. Because my wallet still doesn't have as much in it as it needs to have. And, uh, you know, that things still aren't what they need to be at work. And maybe I'm doing something wrong. And maybe you're doing something wrong. And we've got to be clear about what God promises in prayer. What he promises is if you'll talk to him about it and don't just worry about it, you talk to him about it honestly with thanksgiving, you will gradually experience it'll be a little less loud in your head. It won't be silent, but it'll get a little bit less loud. The worries, riches, but don't just sit there, do they'll get a little softer. And you know what that feels like? Relief. How loud things are in our minds is what makes life draining. And as it gets a little bit quieter, you find yourself breathing. We long for rest. We long for some quiet, some peace and quiet. But it doesn't come from a geographical cure. You know the problem with the geographical cure? Is when you get out of the plane, your problem just walk down the gangplank. Or not gangplank. But <laughs> that's not a good thing. What kind of airline do you take, Mike? Um, peace of God will not allow us to soothe hunger. 
will not allow us, to, it will allow us to soothe hunger, excuse me, it will not allow us to satisfy, silence, or submerge it. Peace of God doesn't eliminate suffering, we promise that the peace of God allows us to endure it. And there's something powerful here. Learning to soothe the loudness is deeply impactful. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again. There's something worthwhile here. Learning to soothe the loudness is deeply impactful. Some of you know exactly what I mean. You've been in desperate places and you prayed about it. And it's not that it, it, but there is something that happens where you didn't worry as much as you were, and it felt like a relief, didn't it? That's what God promises in prayer. Um, reason we can't wait, well, I'm going to throw something up here. Our will, we want to silence, satisfy, and submerge. I think this might be how it works. And Worship team, come on up. You know what God's will is? God's will is that we wait perseveringly and respond gently. How do we pull that off? By our prayers. Be real. Be still. Breathe freely. Exhale your concerns and inhale his commitments. Father, your will calls us to have things surface that we really don't want to deal with, but learn to soothe the things that are surfaced by clinging to promises, not just pain, hope, not just hurt. And as we are real about what we're going through and are still and think about who we're talking to and breathe freely, exhale these concerns and inhale commitments, we receive through the peace of God the power space, a little bit of quietness that allows us to wait perseveringly and respond gently. Continue to teach us about what it means to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.